to get back to the question, the effect on the primary care physician. So, the first thing you have to look at the guidelines, do you agree with them? I'm not sure anybody was actually on the committee, but the veil of secrecy and all this stuff. My concern about guidelines, because I've seen this happen, is that they become perverted and then they become practice management and you have to practice by this and except guidelines are guidelines and the CDC said that they were guidelines and on the phone they said these are just guidelines intended for primary care physicians for the initiation of opioid therapy and then the management. So they theoretically don't apply to pain management specialists but if you think about it why should it apply to one set of physicians and not another physicians? So, and not another set of physicians. So I think that uh, if you look at the guidelines themselves, there's 12 of them. And the recommendations are not terribly unreasonable, but you need to read the pages that follow each recommendation, and there's some very interesting things in there. Uh, the CDC, I have this little saying about the CDC, wherever death goes, so does the CDC, and there's a lot of death with opioid overdoses. So the CDC is gonna make its place, and and have their guidelines. The evidence for these guidelines is poor to non-existent, even by the CDC standards. Yet, we had to do something, and these were going to get published no matter what you said, based on my conversations with the CDC and the feedback. Um, I think my, my concern is that I'm not so concerned about patients who are initiated on opioid therapy. I think it's they're probably pretty prudent. My concern is that the population that's out there on over their magic number of 90, I worry about that because I think that insurers and government agencies or whoever's paying the bill will say, you're over 90, you're cut off, or we're not going to pay for this anymore, whatever. Those patients will be harmed. And patients need to accept strategies. Uh, or doctors have to learn new, exit, we call them exit strategies. And actually, I just published a book called Chronic Pain, uh, I'm sorry, Controlled Substances in Chronic Pain, Controlled Substance Management in Chronic Pain, A Balanced Approach. It just came out in June. And we have a section that I wrote, Chapter 14, called Exit Strategies. And what we're seeing, and the data that we've heard from pharmaceutical companies and other agencies, that the opioid prescriptions are going down. And that's the effect that the CDC was looking for. So I think that the, if you're a primary care physician and you are writing a lot of opioids because there's no pain management doctors in your state or your area, I think the guidelines will be helpful. The question is what do you do if you inherit these folks on orbital doses of opioids? I think you need to have some, the CDC guidelines are good, you'll need to have some training though. You're going to have to have some help in managing those folks, and I'm concerned that those folks will be hurt by regulatory agencies. I think you'd have to ask Florida physicians. We did the exact same thing. In 2011, we had our own guidelines. Actually, they became legislation, weren't guidelines, it was law. And the effect was that there was a very large patient dump from primary care onto those who were not controlled substance prescribers. So the law in Florida mandated that primary care or anyone writing these medicines do all this stuff. Now, the pain management doctors were already doing it. It was no big deal for us, but for primary care, it was a big deal. So I think that from a practical standpoint, the net effect is the same. You'll see less patients. They will be managing less patients with less opioids. That's the net effect, and that's what they wanted. In my practice, that's a primary focus for me. Uh, so you have someone with a pain problem, you have multiple ways of treating it. So do you give them medication, and how long do you give them medication for? It doesn't necessarily have to be an opioid, by the way. Or can you do a procedure that will be successful, or a combination of all of the above. So I think an interventional pain has a practice, has a certainly a place at the table in chronic pain. I think you have to have a certain skill set to do it, obviously. My experience is that the docs who are primary care physicians who don't have that skill set 
tend to take a lot of this on themselves in terms of pharmacologic management. And then you have trouble seeing the forest through the trees because you're giving multiple medicines when you might just have done a selective nerve root injection and gotten the same effect. So, and on the flip side, you have interventional pain docs who will not write one prescription and just inject people until the cows come home. So you gotta have balance in between. I think it's an extremely poor, important part of pain management. I think that it, uh, it does cost, there's a cost associated with it because it is a procedure. Um, I think it's, it should definitely be part of any pain management physician's uh, approach. They may not have to do it, but they should be associated with someone who can do these procedures. And more importantly, getting back to if they're not the question, then what's the answer? That primary care physician may not, not know how to do any interventional procedure, but they know that that diagnosis is amenable to an interventional procedure. Let's send them to that doctor. Maybe we don't have to use all these medications. Sure, because, you know, even if a patient's not on any opioid therapy at all, they could be on four adjuvant medicines. That's four medications they have to deal with. There are a host of side effects. There's, there's, there's baggage associated with all medication. I don't care what it is, especially, and especially with anti-inflammatories, which can be very serious baggage. If you can mitigate the use of these medications through a simple interventional procedure, why not?